Welcome back everybody, welcome back to the channel. So today we're going to be talking about how to build a basic standard library. This is going to be a two-part video series where we kind of talk about, before we start working on our virtual machine, what are both the basic things that we need to do to build our standard library, and then what are the things that we can aspire to do once we have a fully-fledged programming language. And then after that, we can talk about what to do beyond that and so on and so forth. So today, like I said, we're going to be talking about what are the basic things. So these are going to be the bare bones things that you need absolutely for your programming language to work. Otherwise, it won't work. And these are objectives. So in my opinion, of course, you guys can always do whatever you want. But excluding my programming language, in my opinion, these are the basics of what you need, regardless of what programming language you are going to have. If you're going to have an object-oriented programming language, you're definitely going to need these things. So just to stay on topic, I made a little file here so we can kind of just look at this to see. Oh, that is way too small. We can look at this to see what we need to look at. So first, we're going to look at string. Now, I know some of these we've already kind of seen, but let's just kind of go over it just to be comprehensive and go through everything. So what we're going to do is we're going to want to create a string class. Now, I'm not going to go through all of this code. It's going to be pretty boring, and I'm pretty sure you guys can kind of get a gist of what the code is doing. You can just check it out. My standard library is going to be located in the sharp directory or the main directory of the repository inside of the lib and support in 0.2.805, and you can find all of my folders and everything in there. So for the string class, strings in a programming language are going to be the basic level or the basic way for us to basically do certain things in our language. So whenever we have like, for instance, um, I don't know if we have like a message MSG and we want to assign some value. So we want to say dollar sign string and we can say our string is and then we put our string. Now what this does is this is called string inlining where we basically inline a variable inside of the string. And what this is going to translate into is our string is, and it's going to close the string and put a plus, parentheses here, and remove this, another parentheses, and another plus, and finally a closing string value. So it kind of generates this code. Now, how does this code work? So on the back end of our compiler, now this is where it gets into like theory of trying to figure out exactly how your code is going to work. It's really tough for me to kind of explain this, but in short, what you want to do is you want to try to figure out how you're going to expect your code to operate, even though you haven't really written that much code to begin with for it to properly work. But I'm pretty sure you can kind of understand like strings need to be concatenated. There's basic things you need to do. Like, for instance, you have various different constructors. Now, in our example where we have, you know, our this string then the plus or whatever what this is going to have to do is this is going to have to create a string object so what you're going to have to do is create a string constructor that matches the type of this object so this is going to be an int 8 and that's going to be an array of int 8s which are going to represent a string or a chart array in my programming language and we're going to need to have the corresponding constructor to match the value so just kind of keep that in mind when you're when we're kind of going through a lot of this code you want to make sure that you don't just say, oh, I need this class, I need this class, and that class. You also want to think about when you, how do you construct the class and how you do other things. And I also think I missed one. I did. That was primitives. So we'll go over that one as well. So for the string class, we have, of course, our uh, constructors, like I mentioned. You also want to have things like an append function. And now when I wrote this code originally, I wrote the basic amount of stuff in here. Like when we're writing this standard library, you're going to see there's a lot of code that's written in here. Like there's a ton of, I mean, this file is pretty big. As you can see, it goes pretty far. So when I started out, I did not write all of this code and I do not recommend you do that as well. I would recommend that you would just kind of wait and write the basic amount of stuff. So what you need is you're going to need for, and this kind of goes for any of the classes we're going to go over today. You need a basic constructor of how to create your data. You're going to need to have most likely operator overloads to interact with the type that you're creating. And then you want to have finally 
uh, helper functions such as the ability to get the data of the class that you're creating and some array methods to you know convert your data to an array if possible and that's pretty much it everything else is pretty much just helper methods so um, and of course uh, you, we're gonna have a hash code or a hash function and what this does is this is just like Java now I got this code from somewhere I do not remember uh, but this basically what it does is creates a unique hash for your string values. So if you have a string, if any of you guys remember in Java, when you say string.hash, that gives you an integer, which represents that hash value of that string. So you can use that to do comparisons to check if strings are the same. Now, I have no idea, like I said, how this function works, but you guys can, of course, copy this code down. Uh, this is the best and most concise way to generate a hash value. For a string that I found online so this is what I have but yeah so this is kind of a basic run through of the string class so hopefully that makes sense if you guys have any questions you can always just put them in the comment section below and I'll be happy to respond to it in a later video so let's kind of look at loopable next so I know you see up here like I'm inheriting this loopable class in our programming language you want to have what and I'm gonna make up this word on the spot you want to have modular interfaces and modular interfaces basically mean that you want to create a certain amount of interfaces that now this is the only modular interface that I have well I actually have a few that's not true but you want to create a couple of modular interfaces that interact directly with the compiler so this loopable class is basically going to be the basic form of allowing somebody to loop over something so if I go to, for example, if I go to my tests and I go back to my syntax file and in here, if I say, um, I don't know, string of string and I say it's equal to hello comma world and that's going to be our string message. Now, if I for each the string, this allows me to, so if I say char or ch, whoops, in and str this allows me as the user to be able to create a class that basically traverses the data or the elements in that list and you want to do this because as a developer you want people when they're building on top of your language to be able to just quickly and easily hook into existing code and technology within your program so a basic way to explain this at the high level is our for each statement is going to expect one of two things. It's either going to expect a array. So if we have a R R Y of a new underscore or new var array. So if we have a var array of 10 or whatever, it doesn't really matter var array of one. So we can traverse anything that is an array set or anything that implements the loopable interface. And the loopable interface is going to have a function that we're going to need to implement called get elements and it's going to return a type of t array and as you can see this is a generic interface so we force the string class to implement this loopable interface of int 8 and then down here we can see that we have where is it i'm going to do a search for get elements so i have this get elements function and i'm implementing that function based on the definition in the interface and i return data which is the actual data of the string so when we actually do our for each statement on the string we're just going to say basically for each string dot get underscore elements and it works perfectly normal this is exactly the same way that basically if i were to have the array example that you saw a few seconds ago where it's an actual array and we just traverse that array so it's just a very quick and easy way to do it and it gives the user the power to hook into the language. So that's one of them. Uh, let's see, what else do we have? Uh, we also have object. Now we went over this in the last episode, but let's just quickly go over it. So object is the base level class for all of our classes in language. So another thing you wanna think about when you're building your standard library is you don't wanna just build stuff willy nilly, that you wanna like try to be methodical about how you set your stuff up. And what I mean by that is if you notice here, the object class is a stable class, meaning that I don't want the user to be able to modify the object class. So that means they can't add extension functions to this class and yeah. So you just want to you just want to think about various different things that you want the user to be able to do and not be able to do with your standard library. 
because if they can just modify and just do whatever, then that could complicate things down the road. Um, but as you notice, the and I think we'll talk about that next. Yeah. So as you notice, the object class inherits two interfaces. Now, before we get into those interfaces, you want to have a couple different things in your language. So if you're going to build an object-oriented programming language, you're going to need to have a well. I guess that goes into these two interfaces here. You're going to want to have a way to be able to print something to a string. You want to also have a way to have a hash as well. This is pulled straight out of Java, by the way. And then this is my own thing where like if you want to have a GUID or a unique, a generated unique ID, then you can also have that function as well. And that's implemented inside of both of these. The concept behind that is that if we have, you know, some object and basically here's a quick way of explaining this. So if I go to console, right? And here, let me split this vertically and I try to print something. So if I go down here to syntax and I say, I don't know, um, let's say the class of building, right? So if I say building and I say new building, new building. So if I try to say print line and I say building and let's see, so I say building is then dollar sign building. What that's going to do is that's going to force me to concatenate this building object to this string. But there's a problem. The building object is just a random class. And it's not technically a concatenatable value. I just made that word up. Basically, it's not like an array of characters or anything. So we need to have a way at the basically high level to represent every single object as a string value. So when we concatenate it, we will just get nothing, basically, or null, depending on what this toString function returns. So if we go to here, this is a console.sharp code that I have to basically allow me to print stuff to the console. And what it does is I have this print function here. So you can print like a string, you can print like an int8, a var array, and various other things. But if I go down here to, what is it, printable? So print line printable. Now, if I were to just print building by itself, or print line building by itself, I would have to be able to convert this building object to a string somehow. So what it's gonna do is it's just going to pass this building object as a printable interface because every class inherits object and object inherits printable. And then it's gonna just call the two string function as you can see here, and it's gonna get the data based off of that two string. Now this is kind of unsafe because if you return null, uh, this could cause an exception, so I'm going to have to fix that, but that's not the point for the video. But as you can see, this is kind of where I get into the whole thinking about this methodically. You want to, even though we haven't built the console class yet, to be able to print stuff to the console, we still want to be able to have something in the future that we can hook into to be able to use that functionality to print stuff to the console. So if I go to, let's see, what's the next one? So unique and printable. So if I go to printable, we can see here, here's a interface that I'm using for the programming language and it has a two string function, which is implemented by the object class. And then we also have, what was the other one? It was printable and unique. Unique has a hash and a GUID function, which the object class also must implement. So these are just a couple different things that I did to kind of make using the language a lot more seamless. So after that, let's see what else we have. Uh, so we have nil. So in my programming language, it's going to be different for you guys. If you, you're probably going to have something like a void type or something. In my language, a void type is nil. That's the keyword for it. So yours might say like void or something. It doesn't matter, but basically what you want to do is you want to create a nil class. And you want to be able to, now I took this straight from Colin, to be honest. What you want to basically be able to do is have a nil variable and access that nil variable and be able to basically convert that value to a string. So for instance, if we're like returning something from a function and we're returning underscore nil as the class, we can return nil.instance, which is going to return basically nothing. This is just a high level way for us to represent void without really technically returning void, if that makes any sense. After that, we have enum. Now, we've already gone over this as well. Uh, so enum is basically a basic way for me to interface with enums. So when we have our enums, when we create the actual class for our color class and everything else, do I actually have an enum example? Yeah. 
So like this enum color here, when we actually create this enum and we create like fields in there like red, uh, green, and blue, once we actually create those, these are going to be fields that are going to be static inside of this colors class. And in the enum, we want to be able to access the name. So this goes back to the whole like thinking about how everything is connected. When we actually print an enum or if we concatenate an enum, so if I say um, color red is, and then I say dollar sign, and then I directly put the value of color dot red, this is going to basically return the value of this. It's going to say color red is red. Now, the way that this works is technically speaking, this value translates into class color and then red of color and green and blue. And they're all going to be based on the color class. And that's what this gets translated into. So how exactly do we get this red value from here? Well, of course, we're going to use the true string method, but that's not enough, right? Because we have to generate some code in order to make all this work. So what I do is I basically assign this name value at compile time and I generate code to assign this statically for each class or for each field. So I go into that field, I access this name variable and I set the name based on whatever the name of the field is. And I set the ordinal based on whatever the assigned ordinal is for that enum. And of course, beyond that, you also want to, again, have your standard like initial instantiation of the enum class. So when we actually instantiate our enums, we need to have these constructors available to properly do that. And then, of course, we again have our operator overload functions to be able to do basic things on the actual class. So here's how I actually get the name. So I have this get name, which returns an int 8, get ordinal, which returns the actual ordinal. And then finally, a to string function, which is implemented. Now, what this is called is this is called method overriding. So what's effectively going to happen at the compiler level is that when this function of to string is called inside of the printable class, it's going to take a look at the instance and it's going to call the nearest or the closest function in that instance that can be executed based on where and the hierarchical structure it was defined at. Meaning that if we have an enum class, we're going to call this function instead of the object function inside of, or instead of the two string function inside of the object, because this function is the next nearest implemented function that is tied to that overrided function for the interface. So hopefully that made sense. That didn't really sound that good when I mentioned it, but that's how that works. Uh, we also want to have. What else? We also want to have exceptions. So for exceptions, we basically want to have a way to throw stuff, obviously, right? We're going to have an exception system. So we want to create a base level class for exceptions. This is extremely important. Now, I copied my exception system from Java. I tried to do my own exception system previously before in version 1.0 of the compiler, and I absolutely failed miserably. So I ended up just copying Java's exception system almost verbatim. So I basically have the throwable class. Now, you guys don't need to call it throwable, but the idea is that you need to have a base level exception class that is going to represent exceptions in your programming language. So that's what this is. And I have some code in here. I, I don't want this video to drag. So we will talk about this later, but literally almost all of this code is literally straight from the Java virtual machine. So we'll go into how that works later. It's really cool, um, but you guys can check it out if you want, and hopefully you can connect the dots. Um, it's, I don't think it's too complicated, but we also want to have a host of other exceptions. So we want to have our, so what I do is I basically have for mine a base level exception class, which is throwable, and then a higher level exception class which is called exception and then everything after that inherits the exception class so that's kind of how java does it so that's what i ended up doing and yeah so you want to create various different things stack overflow exceptions thread stack exceptions invalid operation exceptions so on and so forth you guys can kind of read through this and take a look at it but you also want to create aliases for those exceptions as well now you might not have aliases in your programming language if not you don't have to do this but I did it to kind of make writing exceptions a little bit faster. 
it also would be a good idea to have some basic helper methods for throwing exceptions. So like you can have a runtime error function, which basically returns a runtime exception by returning this class here. Or you could have a runtime error function, which just creates a new runtime exception function, as well as a to-do function for any to-dos that you need to do in your language, and it will just throw a not implemented error of whatever the message is. So just some little nice tidbits that you can throw in there. Um, but yeah, after that, we also want to have primitives. So in your programming language, if again, this is only for if you have an object or any programming language, uh, primitives, where is that? So this is a basic way for us to interact with the compiler at a high level. So I'm sure you guys know I have actual literal values of integers. So if I go back to the string, you can see here that underscore int 8 array. This is an actual literal integer. So for this data array, I can't say data dot whatever because it's not really a class. It's an array of numbers. So you can't really do anything with it. So that's where the primitive class comes in. What this basically represents is a way for us to wrap the native functionality of our programming language with a higher level construct to do a ton of different things. So what you want to do for a primitive class is you want to create what's called a base level class or a God class. And that's going to represent basically an integer, right? So it's going to be an integer of whatever type and it's going to hold a value of whatever type. And you want to create your basic constructor. You also want to create your hash function which is going to override the object's hash function. So when you actually return the value from there, you're going to be returning whatever this value is. And then you want to create a bunch of operator overloads. This is going to be allowing you to do basic functionality when it comes to interacting with this. And you want to do it for every single type. So you want to do it for, you know, for mine, in my example, I have u longs, longs, u ints, ints, u shorts, and more. So I have all of these various different uh, operator overloads, and there's a ton. Um, as you can see, it just keeps going. And you also may want to create a couple of conversion functions as well. So to convert your, you know, whatever your type is to a different type, you can also do that as well. This is actually taken straight from the Kotlin standard library as well. Kotlin does this and their primitives. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of how it works. And of course, you know, this was built later on, but you also want to have a way to parse integers, right? So if you want to parse a string, and you want to convert that string into a number, you should allow the user to be able to do that. Um, and then of course our two string value is just gonna return the value that is up at the top. So I'm not gonna scroll back up, but yeah, it's gonna return that. And finally, we can see here, now we need to create our true wrapper classes. So we need to create our ulong class, which is gonna contain all of these various different constructor values. And it's gonna call the base constructor of the integer class. And it's just going to pass in the integer value and everything just works magically. And finally, you want to have your final types. So the reason why these operator overloads are not inside of the integer class is because you may not know what the type is, right? The only reason for this is although we have like, you know, u long and int shorts and bytes and chars, we have what's called a Boolean. And Boolean does not play nice with those uh, operator overloads. So for Boolean, we want to basically check the value every time when we plus get it or plus minus it or whatever. You really shouldn't be doing this with Booleans anyway, but again, just to allow this to be happening, I basically added all of these various different operator overloads and it just checks to see if the value is true. If so, it's a one or it's a zero and we just basically return that value. So that's going to be it for that. Let's see what else we have. Um, so you also want to have a platform class. Let's see, this video, hopefully it's not too long. Uh, yeah, it's, it's getting up there. So what we want to do is now, I think this is actually the last few things you need to do. Yeah. So you want to create a platform class. This is going to represent the starter portion of your class for your standard library. And we're going to go over this a little bit later on in our compilation phase, but I'm just going to give you the basics. What you're going to need to have is you're going to need to have what's called your starter method prototypes. And what these are, these are basically just a bunch of function pointer variables that represent various different types of main methods that the user can define. Now, these are going to have to be assigned their value at compile time, and we'll just, we'll worry about that later, but yeah, that's how that works. Uh, and then you also want to create 
two types of variables. We want to create a TLS init uh, function and a static init function. And what these two are for, these are very important, guys. If you're going to have a multi-threaded programming language, this is for initializing your thread local system. This is for initializing your static system. So for any static variables that you have, all of that code goes inside of here. For any thread locals, it goes in here. And finally, you want to have what's called a entry point method. So basically, every time when sharp starts and the program runs, this is the first thing that gets called, right? And you want to do some basic setup. Uh, so we'll go over the build class in a little bit, but you want to set up some basic information about your program. So, you know, what's the name of the file that you're executing? What is the version of that file, which is going to be inside of the executable when we process it later? What is the platform that we're currently running on? And what is the OS that we're running on? So is it Windows or Linux or whatever? Um, and then you want to do your static init and TLS init. Now, here's a fun fact for you guys. This is going to be, we're going to go over this in the next episode, but this is kind of a peek into my multi-threading system. Basically, whenever you create a thread local variable, so if I create a thread local of i, right, and let's assign it to 9, that's fine, whatever. So if I create a thread local of i and assign it to 9, the way that this code gets assigned is once the entry point function gets called, we call first our static setup. And then we call our TLS init, and that's going to then execute the code that is assigning this I variable. Now, I know what you're thinking, right? Like, well, what if you create a thread? How does that work? Well, it's pretty simple. So the way that I did it is in my, this is my multi-threading or my thread class for basic multi-threading. Um, so basically what I do is, where is it? So if I go to start, so whenever I start a thread, I basically call thread create. And that calls the thread kernel, right, which starts a thread and it does a bunch of stuff that you don't really need to care about for now. But you can see here I call platform.tls init. And what that does is basically whenever we start a thread in our programming language, at the high level what we do is we go into this SRT thread start function. Again, when the user passes their main method for the thread class, that is not going to initially run first. We're going to run this code first and then we're going to eventually call the main method but before we call the main method we need to set up our tls function so that's really thinking far ahead into our language but that's kind of how it works so very important for you guys to add that um, but yeah so that is a basic way of how i set up my platform and as you can see down here i have a win statement that checks to see if any of these variables are not equal to zero and it's only going to be one of them that are going to be populated. So I'm basically just going to pick which one and call the actual appropriate function. So once we do all of that, then we're good to go. And let's see, so what else? We have stack state. So this is going to be a class that is taken straight from the Java virtual machine. What this does is this is basically allowing us to be able to capture the state of the stack. And we do this as a way to save memory and to speed up our exception system. Now, I know this is going to be unrealistic, but I do this because if you're throwing tens of thousands of exceptions every minute, then we want to be able to have an efficient way of capturing the state of the stack without having to generate all of the information for exceptions. Because every time there's an exception, there's a crap ton of information that needs to be found and sourced out for the exception to actually be created. So yeah, basically what I do is I just have a list of what are the addresses to all of the methods that we've called and what is the address to the PC or the program counter that we were at at the time of calling that function. So that's that, um, very important. We will get into my exception system later. Like I said, it's taken straight from the Java virtual machine. So I'm actually going to pull up literal Java code later on so we can kind of compare and contrast my exception system with Java's because it's not exactly the same. I made mine a little simpler, but yeah. Uh, you also want to have a VM class. This is going to basically be a way for us to do our, what I call kernel work. That's why it's inside of the platform kernel folder. The kernel basically is going to represent at the lowest level possible what we're going to need to do for our programming language. So this is going to hold a ton of different things 
that we're going to need to do and you're going to be calling this code very early on to test out your virtual machine to make sure everything works so you're going to do stuff like get frame info what that's going to do is that's going to return a stack state which you're basically just going to be getting the state of the current stack that we're at uh, you can also get the stack trace by passing in a stack state which is going to then return you a string which is then going to build a stack trace based on the state of that thing that you passed in and you also want to do stuff like creating threads suspending threads uh, killing threads and a bunch of other various things uh, to implement or to interface with the actual virtual machine so there's that you want to make sure you do that you also want to have a build class this is going to represent the basic way for us to hold information about our programming language or about our program that we're executing so at runtime if you want to figure out are we windows are we linux um, this is how you do it you just check to see if the os is equal to whatever it is uh, you can also do this for app name platform and version and yeah just various different information now this is very sparse right now i'm still working i mean i can easily add in more information in here but this is what i have so that's that also we want to do dependencies so this is the last thing that you want to do since we're actually going to be building a optimization or not an optimization a code obfuscation system in our actual programming language you want to build a dependencies file now yours is not going to be as big as mine currently i have a ton of things in here that i basically need to always be present and not obfuscated in order for my programming language to work properly so this is going to be this is a living breathing document so as time goes on i may add stuff maybe i subtract stuff but you just basically want to do the basic setup of you know keeping or writing out the stuff that you want to keep as far as your modules and then you also want to write out what are some of the classes you want to keep for your obfuscation system so i have different things in here like i want to keep you know various different exceptions i need to keep stack state because this actually interfaces with the virtual machine at the low level and I need to actually instantiate this stack state class so I need to access all the fields and stuff in there to be able to assign that information so that has to stay up thread has to stay up for multiple reasons as well as string so just keep this in mind hopefully this made sense for you guys um, but yeah these are the basic things that you need for your programming language to work now you notice I didn't go into fancy stuff like creating you know lists hash tables um you know hash maps all all these other things that we've come to know and love as developers you don't need any of that crap at the very start of your programming language so i definitely recommend you guys take the time out and write this code even if it takes you a while even if you're still not 100 percent sure about how everything is going to work that's totally fine you don't need to know exactly how it's going to work just write the code and then modify it later so that's going to be it for today, guys. Hopefully that made sense. If you guys have any questions, as I always say, you can put them in the comment section below. And of course, if you guys would love to help support the channel, you can head over to the GitHub repository at andrewdevcd slash sharp. And when you do, you can watch Star and fork this repository. Definitely do that. That's going to give this repository a lot more visibility and let other developers know this language exists. Also, if you guys are curious about maybe some of the things that I've been up to on a daily basis, you can head over to the master or the remastered branch. And the remastered branch is going to contain pretty much, oh, I'm not used to this interface. Where is the, where are the commits? Oh, it's over here. Okay. Um, so that completely threw me off. But I write some pretty wordy commits so you can kind of get a gist of what I've been up to without really having to look too much in the code. Also, if you guys are curious about some of the things that I'm looking to add to the language in the future or stuff that I've done in the past, you can head over to the docs folder. And in there, there's two main files. There is the changeless file. That's going to be pretty much everything I've done in the past to the language. And the roadmap file contains all that information as well as stuff that I'm looking to add in the future. That's going to be it for today, guys. As usual, if you guys are new to the channel, definitely consider subscribing. And until next time, I'll see you guys later.